great pleasure for me to introduce today Daniela Antonanzovi from, <coughs> sorry, I have to translate from French, Institute for of Mineralogy, Physics of Materials and Cosmochemistry. Correct? Yes. Correct? Okay, so I mean, he is expert in uh, uh, various uh, materials properties of extreme conditions with a kind of current of doing real sciences, right? So, uh, okay, so today he will be talking about, oh, okay, I will read that later. I mean, he is very well known for his elasticity work in iron and materials related to the core. So I met him about many years ago, about 10 years ago or so, in Lawrence Ramon National Labs when our uh, labs were actually very close across, so, 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 so across the gap, and we did a number of very good interesting work at that time. And we were continuing collaborating for a little while, so from time to time, uh, after and after the end of time. At that time, you know, he was postdoc, and I was a staff scientist, but anyway, we, we found a very good uh, time over there. So he uh, actually did his master's in physics in the University of Cologne, correct? Right? Yep. And then he did his two PhD in the University of Pierre Marie Curie. Um, and uh, actually interesting and, 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 and elasticity and wave and entropy of phase shifting model of hydrogen, for example. He's folded there and gave up. Today he's talking about heat and abundance in the Earth's core. And all yours. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for the nice invitation. It's always a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, really an honor for someone working on high pressure mineral physics. Last time I was here was about uh, five years ago, giving a seminar. This is the first slide of my last presentation. The <laughs> color are a little bit different. So if you pay attention, the institute changed the name. We are not uh, Pierre Marie Curie University anymore. We are back to Sorbonne old name, but the topic is pretty much the same. But uh, I will uh, try to narrow down, getting wiser with time, so not all the elements, but just uh, focusing on uh, one light element in the core, silicon. Why so? Well, irrespective of uh, detail, all uh, core formation model based on uh, uh, metal silicate equilibration ends up uh, placing silicon and oxygen in the core. And since we know that uh, oxygen is strongly partitioning in into the liquid part, once dealing with the solid inner core, we are left with the silicon as a primary candidate. So the importance and the interest of looking at uh, iron, uh, iron silicate uh, system as a first uh, proxy for uh, inner core. The ground truth I'd like to benchmark my observation against come from uh, seismology, seismic observation here reduced to one dimensional model like PREM. So since the uh, 80s, uh, we know how compressional weights, P weights, shear weights, uh, and density vary within the earth uh, as a function of depth, or if you prefer, as a function of pressure. And we do have reference uh, values for the inner core. Now the mineral physics counterpart of this program, or this problem, is try to answer this leading question posed by Birch uh, in the early 50s. Uh, what materials might have the elastic properties uh, demonstrated by the seismic wave under the condition of the, of the interior? So we will look at uh, experiment and the calculation uh, constraining the sound velocity and density of the potential candidate as a function of pressure and temperature. Compare that with seismic observation to try to constrain the bulk composition of the, of the core. So just a quick reminder, if we look at uh, pure iron as a starting point, and we look at uh, the density versus pressure at uh, core condition, we notice that pure iron is uh, too dense for the inner core. The actual density difference depends from temperature, your reference equation of state, but it's well established that uh, we need to allow some lighter element uh, to iron uh, to account for this uh, density difference. So for that, silicon can potentially do the job amongst many other elements. So uh, in the recent past, uh, many experiments, well, a few experiments try to address uh, this problem looking at the uh, compressional velocity versus density systematic uh, of iron 
uh, of iron and iron silicon alloys and compare that with the seismic model. However, different studies ended up with different conclusion with uh, silicon uh, estimates ranging from one to two weight percent up to eight uh, weight percent. So a uh, reason for discrepancies come from uh, the difficulties, the intrinsic difficulties of this kind of measurement, but as well the necessary extrapolation. And uh, you can clearly see that if things are extrapolated linear or sublinear, that will uh, probably give uh, origin for some of this uh, offset. So I thought that uh, it's time to clear up this situation, even because uh, most recent ab initio calculation, uh, while uh, uh, this time done at uh, pressure, uh, core pressure as a function of temperature, while being uh, somewhat closer to extrapolation of my previous work, uh, end up with slightly different conclusion. Uh, basically, the message here is that uh, any iron silicon alloys uh, uh, cannot simultaneously match uh, density and shear weights and uh, P weights velocity for the Earth core. So suggesting uh, this calculation that actually silicon cannot be the only like element in the core. So uh, let's try to see what we can say about this problem. And uh, I think it will be important to say what we know, what we plausibly think is the case, but as well honestly state uh, what we cannot constrain. So to do this exercise, I will start uh, first uh, with the reference relation for uh, velocity as a function of density for pure iron at ambient condition. Then I will consider the effect of a silicon alloys on density and on velocity. And uh, then I will kick in the last ingredient, uh, which, are the, uh, which is high temperature. Independent constraint will come as well on the effect of silicon on melting curve. And uh, after we go through this observation, I will uh, see what kind of conclusion we can derive and what we cannot. So uh, the methods I'm going to, to use, uh, I, I'll go for X-ray diffraction, inelastic X-ray scattering, and picosecond acoustics. Uh, I will not spend much time discussing of diffraction, since it's a known technique. I will say a few words in elastic X-ray scattering, and it's a little bit more exotic, and as well because uh, now quite popular synchrotron, but sometimes used without the necessary cares in terms of experimental protocol and data analysis. And I will spend a little bit more time on picosecond acoustics because it's a brand new technique with uh, good potentiality. And it's something that uh, Alex Gonshov is uh, developing at the Geophysical Lab as well. So I thought it would be interesting to show you potentialities of this uh, technique. So inelastic X-ray scattering is uh, a two photon technique, photon in, photon out technique, where a photon of well-defined energy momentum of polarization is inelastically scattered by the sample into a second photon of well-defined energy momentum polarization. Now giving energy and momentum conservation law, the difference between outcoming and coming energy and upcoming and coming weight vectors are the energy momentum transfer to the system. Now in the limit of exchange energy is much smaller than incoming energy, which is the case for uh, phonons. So lattice vibration of the typical order, order of 10 milli electron volt excited by X-ray photons of the order of 10 kilo electron volt the wave uh, number, the momentum is not uh, is, uh, is unchanged, so the scattering angle directly gives the momentum transfer. So performing uh, an energy analysis and uh, an angular analysis of the scattered photon, we have the photon dispersion curve. So in that sense, it's like uh, more uh, typical, typical use technique like elastic neutron scattering, with the advantage of uh, working with X-rays, so be able to focus down to a few tenths of microns and be able to use a diamond undercell. So in, as a cool potential technique gives access to a large range of physical properties. Here I will run uh, narrow down the interest to some velocity, which can be obtained from the initial dispersion of the acoustic modes, which are called acoustic, right, because uh, they have a slow proportion of the sound velocity, and then the elastic moduli. Full the potential of the technique is obtained for working on single crystal. However, at high pressure, very often measurements are carried out on powder, either because single crystals are not available, or for instance, like for iron, the phase transition from the, the cubic structure to hexagonal structure disrupts the single crystal. So when working on powder, we have to deal with this loss of directional information. So what is measured is some aggregate for non-dispersion. Now, in the limit of ideal randomly oriented powder, and if we limit uh, the first neighbor interaction within the framework of Borbor-Karma lattice gamma theory, the photon dispersion is expected to have 
a sinusoidal shape and depend from two parameters, the compression of velocity and this Q max, which is the, ma the man value of exchange momentum at which the sinus dispersion uh, get this flat, this maximum value. So one thing to look at is that these two numbers are coupled. So in absence of data very close to the elastic line, really in the linear region, uh, there is a dependence of the velo derived velocity from Q max. So beside the necessary interest of having experiment with the right energy resolution, it's important to mind momentum resolution, but as well the Q setting, the number of points we will constrain the dispersion and how they are re related within the first Brunner zone. So these are uh, look like data looks like at the highest pressure I reached on, uh, on iron. These are the raw data, spectra characterized by this huge elastic line at zero energy, very intense uh, phonon by the thick uh, diamond anvils, the longitudinal acoustic and transverse acoustic of diamond, and these little guys or uh, sample signal is this uh, longitudinal acoustic phonon of iron. So with this gives us the energy position, the, we have several detectors at different angles that gives you the momentum resolution, and we typically map the first brilliant zone collecting six to nine spectra in this case from 0 to 12.5 nanometers minus 1. We fit that with the sinus curve deriving in sound velocities. In parallel, we get uh, diffraction. This is important to have a clear phase assessment, density determination, but as well to look at uh, texture. These are the obtained data caked uh, into uh, one uh, well, we kicked around the beam to have uh, one deep projection. And it's important to observe that uh, w if these lines are not straight, if they start having some waving, this is indication of uh, plastic deformation. And as well, the intensity should be as smooth as possible across the line, indicating that we are close to a random distribution of our uh, intensities or to our uh, orientation of the grain. If we start having something very spotty, we are far from this uh, random uh, approximation. So we clearly we are measuring something, but then the interpretation is not uh, as straightforward. So picrostack on the acoustic. This is complementary technique, laboratory technique, and is a, a pump probe optical method uh, developed over the last 20 years, mostly to look at mechanical properties and thermal properties of thin film. What we did was to develop a setup to use the same technique in diamond and cell. So a, fem a femtosecond uh, pulse is focused either to metallic sample or to a transducer. When it's absorbed, it uh, generates a small and sudden temperature increase, few uh, degrees are enough to generate a thermal stress. This uh, thermal stress relaxed launching, uh, launching a longitudinal train field, which is an acoustic echo that propagates across the sample and is detected on the other side by a probe beam which uh, measure the variation of the reflectivity as a function of time. Now, qualitatively, the two things you have to keep in mind is that uh, the real part of the reflectivity is mostly affected by the photoelastic uh, contribution. So it's sensitive to the modification both of the acoustic wave and the heat waves arriving uh, at the other surface. While the imaginary part is mostly sensitive to surface displacement. So it's something really like uh, acoustic interferometry in this, uh, in this sense. So the way we developed that in practice uh, is uh, using uh, a tiny sapphire laser. We split the 100 femtosecond beam into pump and probe, which are focused on the two opposite surface of the sample loaded in a diamond and the cell. So when the pump hit the surface, they generate the acoustic echoes that travel across the sample and are detected by the probe on the opposite side, which is uh, delayed as a, by a, de a delay line to measure the optical reflectivity as a function of time. Changing our uh, detection configuration, we can move from uh, uh, the reflectometry geometry, where we can measure the real part of the reflectivity. So we are uh, sensitive to the observation, the refractive, refractive index modification, or we can work in the interferometry configuration. In this case, we are sensitive to the imaginary part of reflectivity, where the signal is mainly proportional to the surface displacement. So things might look complicated, but at the end, the signal light is very simple. In its simplest uh, configuration, with the collinear pump and probe, this is basically back to 
classic ultrasonic interferometry. What we measure is the travel time of multiple reverberation across the sample, and uh, from this uh, time of flight measurement, we can get the velocity provided known uh, the thickness of the sample, either from uh, an equation of state, uh, for instance. However, what we can do is uh, as well scan uh, this uh, surface and uh, get uh, this uh, kind of image where uh, we have a reference image and then a delay as function of time. For isotropic medium, it's like uh, throwing a stone in a lake. And what you see is uh, at the zero time, the, the, the central beam and then the waves opening up. This is the uh, the basically this, uh, the manifestation of the surface uh, of the spheric waves uh, arriving on the sample. In this case, we can uh, analyze this movie and independently got uh, the velocity and the thickness without any input of the external equation of state. Now, if the sample uh, is not uh, isotropic, it's not a liquid, it's a solid, uh, the, the image we will see are a little bit more complex because it's, the, uh, it's derived from the arrival of the up to three possible acoustic waves, the longitudinal and two different transfers. So in this case, we are expecting a angular dependence of the, of the velocity. And what we are observing are uh, this uh, figure that reflect directly the slowness surface. So in this case, we can uh, simultaneously invert for all the independent elements of the elastic uh, tensor and then either go back to the aggregate velocity or work on the single crystal. These examples are for cubic, but uh, we end up to orthogonal system things getting results. And finally, in case of a, a, a optic uh, transparent sample, what is observed is the interference between uh, the probe and the acoustic uh, waves traveling across the sample. So the so-called brilliance uh, oscillation. And the frequency analysis, like in brilliance spectroscopy, gives uh, the, the frequency of this oscillation depends from the return velocity and the refractive index of the elements. And for what matter kind of application, uh, we can, uh, for instance, use this technique to determine melting curve, this example on the mercury, either using the imagery method so exploiting the fact that solids are isotropic while liquid are isotropic to the melting, or as well the temporal method, which is sensitive to the volume variation, sudden volume variation across uh, solidification, but as well the change in the reflective index uh, from solid to liquid. Data in terms of compressibility, even on liquid, can be analyzed uh, in terms of uh, density versus pressure for various isotherm, and then getting a PVT relation for uh, for liquids. In case of solid, this example of silicon as a function of pressure, we can invert for this angular de 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 dependency of the observed uh, surface waves to get uh, the a refresh evolution of the elastic uh, moduli. With the Alex, uh, we recently worked uh, on uh, hydrogen and deuterium, both in liquid and the solid, and getting uh, the both Brillouin and the acoustic echoes as a function of pressure up to 55 GPA to address the elasticity of uh, hydrogen and exposure ratio. But for what matter the most for uh, this talk, uh, this technique can be applied to iron and uh, it's been uh, used to measure uh, the acoustic echoes up to 152 GPA and iron silicon alloys I will show you later. So now that I present a little bit of the methods, we can go back to the science and look at the silicon in the core starting from a pure iron uh, as a reference. So over the last uh, 20 years, uh, the compression of velocity as a function of density has been measured by several groups with several techniques, uh, uh, ranging from shock wave measurement uh, to pulse echo ultrasonic technique in multi-anvil, laser ultrasonic, both na nanosecond and picosecond time scale, to full system rate like scattering. This was measurement Alex was referring when we were doing before together in Livermore. And, uh, X-ray based technique going from X-ray diffraction method, nuclear resonance, elastic X-ray scattering, and elastic X-ray scattering. Now, I think that it's important to have a multi technique constraint, but when comparing results, especially when you're getting a pressure exceeding the megabar, it's important to use a consistent metrology. So, look at things using the same pressure scale, the same equation of state as reference, 
And once we do that, beside a few data sets that are known to pose a problem, we obtain a set of various uh, technique and various group uh, providing data that well plots along a well-defined line. So I think this is a very strong constraint when many people using different techniques with different uh, advantages or disadvantages tends to the same uh, relation. So we have a reference relation for the compression velocity as a function of density up to the almost the core density at 300k. And we notice that pure iron extrapolate 54% above prem with a slightly steeper slope. We will keep working on that. These are new data we recently published with by elastic plate scattering, where we were uh, adding data at the highest pressure where the data set was a little bit more slim. The, re the reference relation stayed the same. We narrowed down the error bars. But what we did as well was to couple the measure of the compressional velocity with the, the measured bulk modulus uh, to get the shear velocity. And uh, the other important thing I want to stress is that uh, at 300 Kelvin, the, our experimental data very well compare with the latest ab initio calculation at uh, thermal calculation. Very well for the uh, compressional velocity and within the errors as well for the shear velocity. So we can provide reference relationship for, uh, uh, for iron at uh, inner core density, 300 Kelvin for VP and VS. So this will be our starting uh, number. Another thing I like to stress is that uh, once you comp look at the uh, shock waves uh, along the Huguenot, this uh, red open symbol compared with the static wave technique here in black, you see that uh, there is a systematic offset uh, increasing with the uh, pressure because uh, this is along the Huguenot. So my interpretation is that this is an indication of uh, high temperature effect. We will come to that uh, later in the, in the talk. But first, I would like to start addressing the effect of silicon alloy. So the first things we did was start looking at uh, different isotherm, uh, so compression curve for a, oops, a problem with my legend, sorry. So the, the reference here are for pure iron, and in red, these are isotherm at, 30, at 300 Kelvin. This is an isotherm at 1500, and this should be at 2100 Kelvin. So this result show very smooth uh, compression and has been analyzed in terms of pressure, volume, temperature, equation, state, and compared with pure iron. So adding five weight percent of silicon, slightly increased volume uh, at 300K, compressibility is barely affected, but you can observe that uh, adding silicon reduces the thermal expansion of iron. So we can then uh, extrapolate uh, this relation for pure iron and the one obtained for iron silicon alloys to inner core condition and uh, compare with the prem density, and as already anticipated, pure iron is too dense. While adding a five weight percent uh, silicon make it compatible with the prem density for temperature above 5500 uh, Kelvin. Here are these blue lines for 6000. So, so far so good, but uh, the density is the least constrained, well, it's, one of the, it's by far less constrained than velocity in terms of seismic observation. So rather than just jumping to nature and say we have the inner core composition, we move down and measure velocity as well for iron silicon alloy. And uh, here things get a little bit more complicated. Let's start looking first at sample with eight to nine weight percent silicon. Uh, our uh, latest uh, IXS measurement here in blue uh, well compare with the uh, previous measurement of similar composition and allow to discriminate between two different previous inconsistent data set, extend a little bit on the pressure range. And uh, while we cannot yet uh, fully discriminate between a linear fit and uh, a sublinear fit, still our data rather support a linear fit, especially if we bear in mind the results on iron, I would keep uh, linear extrapolation for the compression of velocity. We combined the measured velocity with the bulk modulus to derive the shear velocity as well. So comparing pure iron and iron silicon alloy with nine weight percent up to core density, we observe that uh, adding silicon makes uh, compression of velocity uh, always higher than pure iron. While this is not the case for the shear velocity, the effect is such that uh, at uh, moderate compression, uh, the, uh, the alloy is faster than pure iron, but is not the case of the inner core condition. 
This conclusion has been, uh, is in qualitative support with that uh, suggested by Abinizio calculation, recent Abinizio calculation as well. But probably nine weight per cent is a little bit too much for, uh, for composition. So we'll start looking at samples with less iron content. I hear things get a little bit more confusing. So sorry for the change of a slide, but uh, I received uh, Eric Edmund, who was a PhD student working on that, just sent me this PDF yesterday, uh, so I could not change the color. What I want to show you here are the second acoustic data for the alloy with the five weight percent silicon here in black, which plot well along well defined line, which extrapolate in between a calculation at core pressure and 300 Kelvin, which is done for a 3.3 and 6.6 .6 weight percent silicon. So this provides kind of a consistent picture for six uh, for five weight percent silicon. Comparing with other data set is less straightforward than in case of pure iron. For instance, uh, recent uh, IXS measurement of the Otani group uh, with six weight percent uh, silicon, while still compatible with all error bars, there were data has been actually taken. Extrapolate uh, with a with uh, lower uh, slope, so the difference of core density is quite significant. As well, the, re uh, the previous reference for nine weight percent, we observed that uh, there where we have measurement, uh, nine weight percent silicon is faster than uh, five weight percent, but the slope again is slightly different. So definitely some, some more work is, is needed, but we can qualitatively understand uh, this uh, on the geometry ba based on the geometry. Uh, picosecond acoustics measure velocity along the compression axis of the cell while in elastic X-ray scattering measure the velocity perpendicular to compression axis. So especially at the highest uh, compression, there where we start developing some texture with typically the C-axis aligning along the compression axis, we might start probing slightly prefer the different preferential orientation. So there where we are probing more the C-axis, we are probably faster than where we're probing more the basal plane. Still, we can uh, use this uh, to extrapolate to 300, uh, 1300, uh, to the inner core density of uh, 1300 Kelvin at 300 K. This is obtained BP as a function of silicon content for the various data set, and this is the shear velocity, the function of silicon content. Data looks some scatter, but uh, if we assume for simplicity a linear mixing model, we just throw a line and we can estimate the effect of silicon on the velocity at inner core density of about plus 80 meter per second on the P and minus 60 meter per second on the S for each weight percent of silicon. So the last ingredient we have to stick in is uh, high temperature. So these are very complicated experiment and uh, the data set for pure iron which cover the largest pressure and temperature range is that by Takamaki et al which suggests a constant density of 1,300 uh, kilometer per meter cube, a variation of the compression of velocity of minus 0.09 meter per second per Kelvin. Ab initial calculation uh, rather indicate larger thermal effect, even when limiting at 7,000 K, so before this three melting effect in this linear part, the, expect the computed uh, reduction are minus 0.12 meter per second per Kelvin for BP, and uh, minus 0.32 meter per second for temperature. In the case of alloys, uh, again, we have uh, experiment uh, on uh, iron silicon alloys with six weight percent silicon, which suggests uh, an effect uh, very close to that of uh, pure iron, while a initial calculation, once again, suggests an effect which is uh, larger. It's about uh, the same of pure iron for an alloy with 3.2 weight percent, and for an alloy with 6.7 weight percent, the effect uh, is uh, reduced on VS, but uh, increased on uh, BP. So if we now we want to wrap things up and try to say, can uh, iron silicon alloy match prem velocity and density for acceptable pressure temperature condition? To answer this question, I will start from the established pressure density, uh, velocity density relationship, the PDS, for pure iron at 300 Kelvin, there were all technique and the uh, initial calculation agree. Then I will add the effect of silicon inclusion model uh, as an increase on BP of 80 meter per second for each weight percent and a decrease on VS for 60 meter per cent for each weight percent. And then we need to include temperature effect, which are known to lower both BP and VS, but for which different results with different uh, 
effect. So I will use the three results and see which kind of conclusion we can derive. So in the first thermal model, we will uh, take correction as from a initial calculation on a loss of 6.78%. And we end up matching uh, Krem density VP and DS for an alloy with uh, 11 weight percent of silicon and temperature around 1600 uh, Kelvin. However, this solution is not acceptable because uh, such an alloy would have uh, the, uh, the density not within acceptable pressure range. You need to go much higher than 360 GPA to have this range. Besides the fact that temperature in the 7000 Kelvin are a little bit more ex on the extreme side for, for the core. So formally a solution exists, but not within acceptable pressure range. The other thermal model uh, is the one using uh, the thermal effect uh, as from uh, calculation of pure iron and uh, iron silicon alloy with the low silicon content. In this case, we can match Krem, VP, VS, and density for an alloy of about three weight percent silicon and temperature around 6200 Kelvin. We do not have an uh, experimental equation of state for this alloy yet, but the initial calculation suggests that uh, this alloy to have uh, this density in acceptable pressure range and in qualitative agreement with the fact that uh, we have a reference of pure iron, uh, iron with silicon weight percent silicon, which make this uh, solution uh, potentially acceptable. But we know that experiment there were exists suggest uh, thermal effect uh, smaller than uh, experiment. And if we try to use uh, uh, thermal effect as measured by elastic space detector in laser heating, uh, we only have estimation for VP which suggests uh, that VP and Rho are obtained for an alloy with about one weight percent of silicon and 6300 uh, Kelvin. However, we don't have an effect on DS. If we use any of this correction for v DS, or even if we scale this correction in the same amount for VP, we never end up with the solution comp simultaneously matching VP, DS, and Rho. So, which kind of a constraint uh, we can put uh, on the inner core? Uh, from a methodological point of view, constraint coming only from a pressure and volume, that's for diffraction, or compression velocity and density can be used to exclude solution. But if you want to convert to a solution, we need to come simultaneously considering VP, DS, and density as pertinent pressure and temperature condition. An harmonic effect at high temperature have to be considered together with the silicon content, or in general, light element content. Having uh, being a trade-off between uh, the two, and the presence, possible presence, and amount of silicon in the inner core strongly depend on the way we model this uh, anharmonic uh, effect and the actual core temperature. Ot so, possible solution exists only when we take uh, large temperature correction, relatively high core temperature, and uh, relatively low silicon content. So, an independent once we start dealing with temperature, an independent constraint we have to keep in mind are the melting, the effect on the melting curve. Why so? Because uh, we know that uh, since the inner core is solid, there the geotherm is below the melting line, while the geotherm is above the melting line in the liquid outer core. And uh, the two crosses at the core, at the inner core uh, boundary, there were geotherm and melt cross uh, and so that we can uh, pin core temperature from the melting of the core material at 230 GPA. So uh, we try to do that looking at uh, melting on iron alloys by combined in situ and ex situ technique. I'm running out of time, but uh, I will just, uh, I find, so why do I have 40 minutes left? The point this clock started before. Oh, good. So here the idea is to use uh, in situ technique based on uh, uh, X-ray diffraction. So where uh, the melting diagnostic is the appearance uh, of the diffuse scattering. So the protocol is to bring the, the sample at constant uh, pressure or as constant as we can, ramp up or uh, laser at the uh, final step. And uh, between, uh, for instance, here, uh, measurement at 3300 and 3390 Kelvin, we see appearance of this diffuse scattering. So this is considered last the last temperature we the, sam the sample was uh, solid, and uh, this is the first one where the sample is uh, liquid. And then we recover the sample, we cut uh, to FIB, and we look at ex situ microscopy, and in this case, or diagnostic 
is based on uh, textual analysis. Uh, there were, uh, we didn't serve any diffuse uh, scattering. I hope you can see uh, the sample. This is the case of FFO alloys, uh, still have the same coarse grain of the starting material. While after melting, we see a nice round uh, melt pool. So we confirm in situ and ex situ diagnostic, and uh, we went through all a series of alloys. Here there are data, typically we collect data up to 150 GPA or so. These are measurements we collect with, with literature data for FPSI system in green, FPFPS eutectic in red, and recently for FP, FP3C here, and FPFPO. So what uh, now we can do is that look at the effect of these alloys the on, the temp on the iron uh, melting curve. Looking first at liquidus at uh, under 36, 36, under 36 GPA, so the pressure of the core mantle boundary as a function of light element content, and uh, as you can see, adding silicon barely affect the uh, the melting temperature. The stronger effect is for the addition of volatile elements such as carbon or sulfur and oxygen as a kind of intermediate. Uh, so uh, this is not inner core boundary, this is core mantle boundary. So we have to consider that uh, uh, the melting is not the geotherm there. The melting is equal to the geotherm at the inner core boundary. At core mantle boundary, the, 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 the geotherm is higher than, uh, than the crystallization of, the, of these alloys. And if we estimate that, this is kind of temperature we can expect for core mantle boundary. But what I think is more important besides the absolute value is, again, looking at the fact that uh, a core made only of iron and silicon would have a quite high temperature at the uh, core mantle boundary, higher than the solidus of peridotite. If that was the case, we would have, uh, have extensive melting at the base of the mantle. And we know this is not the case. So we need to reduce uh, the melting. And to do that, we need either to consider a core allowing uh, a significant amount of oxygen, more than uh, 15 atom percent, to lower the melting below the solidus of peridotite, or having some volatile elements. Uh, above five atom percent, either carbon or uh, silicon uh, would do the, the job. So uh, for the discussion we are having, I would say that uh, silicon cannot be the only light element in the, in the core. So uh, trying to answer the question I started my seminar with, can silicon enter in the core? Is there silicon in the core? I would say likely yes. This is because all core differentiation model, whenever you have a even partial uh, mantle, um, core mantle equilibration, we end up having uh, silicon in the core. That explains partition isotopic argument. But with respect to the classical uh, estimate, geochemical estimate, we cannot have too much silicon in the core. Uh, I presented the result on the solid inner core, looking at in velocity and density, which plays an upper limit uh, below five weight percent of uh, silicon. Uh, a very similar conclusion uh, has been driven, uh, derived by a initial calculation on liquid alloys, looking at iron silicon alloys, which again suggests that uh, having more than five weight percent of silicon would be too much for uh, account the seismic observation uh, velocity and density. However, silicon cannot be the only light element. As I was showing you, uh, we can match inner core gram velocity and densities only for kind of extreme case for what we know. Uh, high temperature correction and quite high temperature uh, of the core. This still can be the case, but once we also considering that uh, silicon, since it's, par or it's partition between solid and liquid very close to one, cannot account for uh, the density jump uh, at the inner core boundary. And uh, we need probably something else to lower further the melting temperature down to avoid this extensive pre-melting. So I would say that uh, silicon cannot be the only element in the, in the core, specifically in the inner core. So uh, what else? Oxygen is uh, something that uh, uh, is a, uh, is there each time we consider core mantle uh, uh, equilibration or differentiation. And uh, since it's strongly partitioning, almost exclusively partitioning to liquid, can well account for the density jump at the inner core uh, boundary. 
So a lot of time oxygen is used to fix this. Uh, but for this very same reason, it cannot help in uh, fixing the properties of the inner core since it doesn't enter in the inner core. And concerning the outer core, how much oxygen we can have? Well, there is kind of a, uh, not uh, really conflicting but slight disagreement between experiment, uh, for instance, done by phase group on uh, uh, shockwave measurement of uh, iron uh, oxygen alloys and ab initio calculation on the amount of oxygen needed to account for the seismic velocity. So possibly other element uh, have you to brought in. Uh, for instance, I was showing that uh, volatiles have a very effective, uh, uh, provide a very effective way to lower melting temperature. Sulfur uh, has been observed to have, especially for liquid uh, iron sulfur alloys, density and velocities uh, matching PREM for outer core. There are indications coming both from a static compression and dynamic uh, compression. Uh, carbon has been uh, mostly looked at looking at carbides, so by far too much carbon, so N member. But the indication is such that carbon lowers the shear velocity and the Poisson ratio on the solid inner core, so qualitatively goes on the right direction. But now the question is more about modeling. How can we put, how can we can incorporate uh, significant amount of volatiles uh, in the core? Uh, classical uh, geochemical model based on uh, the volatility, for instance, limited sulfur to two weight percent. Now we can consider something different. If uh, we have uh, uh, planetesimal with uh, differentiated core, carbon rich or a sulfur rich, which merge to the core, or impactor which merge to the core with uh, uh, little uh, differentiation, we can add volatile elements in terms of FES alloys or TC alloys in the core. But this model still needs to be developed. And then there is a big absentee, which is hydrogen. Uh, it's quite uh, in fashion now, but I think that there still are very few information available to be able to pertinently discuss uh, this uh, in a meaningful uh, way. And to conclude, I would really like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, Guillaume Morari in Paris, which is my closest collaborator, Eric Edmund, the PhD student working on iron silicon alloys with Pico Second Acoustic, uh, Simona Rignac, Fred de Kent, and Michel Gauthier, which are the real experts on the Pico Second Acoustic techniques, uh, people at TSRF for inelastic X ray scattering and X ray diffraction measurement, Alexei Bosak, Gaston Garbarino, Mohamed Mezwar, and uh, Gigi Palazzini, Faye and Goncharov here. Uh, Faye has been involved in the elastic X-ray spectrum measurement, and uh, we are collaborating with uh, Alex uh, on the picosecond acoustic measurement, Otani in Sendai, and I would like to thank you as well for your attention. Yes, the, the, the model is coming from uh, this uh, linear effect uh, computed for VS. I'm limiting to 7,000 Kelvin, so before pre-melting, but so this slope, this slope here is coming from that for the alloy, for iron, and uh, that for the, for the alloys, which is uh, one of the most recent calculation, but as well uh, one of the largest effect. But I was pointing you, uh, we need uh, this effect if you want to have silicon. Then this is not necessarily to be the case. If uh, uh, this effect end up to be an overestimation, then uh, we have just to say we cannot have only silicon in the inner core, which is a perfectly acceptable solution. But I think that this is uh, a critical uh, information for which having experiment might be very worth. Because there were there experiment, uh, for instance, on BP, you always notice that the experimental observed correction is smaller than the one uh, by calculation, even without uh, entering the pre-melting region, where the even more exposed. So related to that, what you were talking about, an harmonic effect. Yes. Yeah. I say an... Experimental effect. 
no, no, this, okay. When I say anharmonic, it's because uh, uh, at all these corrections are at constant density. So in a pure harmonic model, is uh, atomic is, uh, uh, is, is an oscillator. If you have two atoms linked by a string, uh, your frequency only depends from volume, uh, not for the combination of pressure and temperature. So all the correction at constant density I have to consider anharmonic. So it's something that goes behind uh, quasi-harmonic uh, potential. So it's behind uh, parabolic interatomic interaction, which this is something that enter explicitly into calculation and has been observed as well in the experiment. Uh, if this system will be truly harmonic, uh, you should not be able to resolve this. And the fact that this is coming from an harmonicity also is quite evident from the fact that uh, at lower density, where thermal expansion is larger, the effect for the same temperature is larger, and the effect becomes smaller with increasing uh, compression, where the thermal expansion is, uh, is less. Is this point uh, different temperatures? Yes, so the, the, this is the, the blue is a 300 Kelvin, and the red is, uh, is in 100. This is, a, uh, this, this is the experiment. It's an elastic X-ray scattering or tiny group. This is out. This here is the s this experiment here. So it's a little bit, oops, back, wrong direction. This is a l same technique, a little bit older paper on pure iron where they have a little bit more data. They went up to 3,000 and uh, you see some uh, effect. But again, effects are larger at small uh, compression and becomes less at high temperature, at high density, but still looks visible at cold condition. And we know they should be there. The matter is uh, how much? Okay. Uh, okay. So, or the first part of the answer is, uh, I didn't stress that. I was looking at all this as binary alloys. First looking at uh, silicon as only element, which is so far what most of the people have been doing, looking at binary system. The melting relation I was uh, showing you are for binary system. Now there is no reason why there should be a binary system. Most likely it's a multi-component solution, which is much more messy. Uh, so th that is where we are starting now looking at ternary composition. But in that case, even before looking at velocity, we sh should start with uh, basic uh, petrology. Just look at phase diagram uh, and see how much uh, elements we can put together in. So I think that the, r the, the, the reality is probably more complicated than that. But to be able to address that in a progressive way, we start looking at binary. Uh, because, th for instance, there have been a bunch of papers suggesting that uh, silicon is magic, can uh, fix everything, while it looks like it's not. Probably need to go that there as well. Uh, as well, most of the experiment uh, or calculation address one element at the time. So when we say we see things telling, say, oh, we have X percent of this uh, element can match density. Sure, this could maybe, but uh, probably once you put, you can always trade some light element with someone else. And how this affect the phase diagram is quite complicated, and this even more complicated how it affect the velocity or the density. So this is clearly ongoing work. In terms of uniqueness of the, of the solution, I don't know, for instance, I already sh was already showing that there is a trade-off uh, between silicon and temperature, which gives you a space of solution. The same uh, kind of space of solution will exist in terms of uh, and member. For instance, there is a ab initio calculation paper uh, is uh, Badro, the first author, is uh, John Brodolt uh, doing most of the calculation where they were looking at uh, multi well, at several binary and looking for combined solution. And they clearly show that there is a wide space of, uh, of solution. When we look at uh, experimentally of iron, silicon, sulfur alloys uh, to get uh, the density of the outer core, 
we observed as well a kind of a trading between sulfur and silicon to get the same density. So uh, that is the reason a trade-off. That is why I think that we need to add as many external constraint uh, we can. Uh, melting is something, for instance, uh, both silicon and sulfur reduce the, the density in a similar way. But uh, silicon gets much stiffer bulk modulus, uh, and silicon does a lower melting. So once we add independent constraint, we can try to address this multi-space uh, element uh, with multi-constraint. I was not uh, using this time for simplicity topological argument based on partitioning, but there are all series of experiments looking at uh, how siderophile element partition between uh, mantle and, uh, and, and, and core. And in that case, having element like oxygen, as which uh, strongly affects the partitioning carbon as well, so there will be reason to discriminate uh, element other than on velocity and density. It's just that in 50 minutes presentation, I cannot <laughs> bring you all the arguments, but we can discuss that. Uh, I think the true is really bringing, uh, and for that, uh, Geophysical Lab, DTM, is a great place. You can get uh, someone expert on all these ingredients and try to put things together. So it, 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 it critically depends on which temperature you are doing this exercise. Yeah, 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 there is, there is, there is, there is, there is, there is, a, yeah, there is a one, uh, one recent uh, nature paper out of the uh, of, uh, K. Rosen, who was starting uh, looking at iron uh, uh, with uh, silicon oxide reading iron and high temperature, they both be there, but uh, while cooling down, uh, the, the, the one will be solved because basically we'll be, we'll be solving SiO2. So it's not exactly the experiment you are thinking, it's the other side of the story. But uh, yeah, the, 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 this depends. So at very high temperature, you can even put magnesium in the core. Uh, but as soon as you could, uh, so at the beginning uh, when everything was molten, you can have much more things in. Then you have to start looking at how things cool down. In that case, you can have exolution. And th this exolution on one side will give you the composition of the core but on the other, it may be interesting, for instance, uh, uh, to explain uh, uh, all the complex uh, chemistry of core mantle boundary or F layers uh, of this uh, seismic observed discontinuity. And uh, in that case, you have a kind of trade off elements or things like that that can add uh, a complexity. So, no, these are experiments that are uh, very cutting edge, but uh, it's are doable nowadays. So uh, we will try to use uh, picosecond acoustic, which is uh, as direct as we can get, but not at 150 GPA. So on silicon, we stopped uh, at. Uh, Something higher. Huh? Yeah, but, but if 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 you have a single crystal, you you can you can get uh, the arrival. These green things are uh, shear weights. So for single crystal. You can get, but you need to be able to preserve a single crystal. Now, we stopped this test experiment uh, at 9 GPA because uh, we were done. We were just using uh, metal ethanol as transmitting medium. So as soon as we cross that, uh, we break. So we can push that a little bit higher. But to do that, uh, we really need to exploit the diffraction of the acoustic beam. So we need uh, something that is uh, relatively large. This is a 100 micron surface. So we can probably reduce to 60 but with 60 micron wide sample and uh, 10 micron 15 micron sample if you can keep a crystal we can get probably to megabar not n not much higher but will be already probably something uh, at least uh, to be able to benchmark a uh, initial calculation at uh, 40 50 gpa but uh, in case of iron we need uh, probably a single crystal or we should uh, try to not uh, look at uh, collinear geometry, but uh, something out and wait long enough to increase our delay line to have beside the arrival of the longitudinal echo as well as the transverse. 
in theory can be generated, uh, but uh, you need big sample and thicker. So this has been done, for instance, uh, with nanosecond acoustics uh, by, what's his name, uh, in uh, Hawaii. And, uh, yeah, but I think that uh, he couldn't get more than 15 or 20 GPA. So I think. Okay, so better so. This is what we were doing here in, the, in some sense, but they're not exactly measure. I mean, our, I don't know what about shocks. Here we were getting DP from excess, from diffraction, the bulk modulus, and combining. So it's in the same sample, one after the other. But it wasn't output from the laser gun, so. The, uh, I, when we were working on that, on uh, single crystal opaque stuff, the data analysis was quite kind of complicated uh, because it's hexagonal system. We're getting the not bulk weights but shear weights, uh, and we were obliging to use some uh, independent contact contra uh, constraint by axial compression, for instance. I think can be exploited, but uh, I would probably, well, for maybe for shear, since the surface weights, uh, Schulte weights are really related to 344, might be a way to do. But again, I think that the highest pressure were the experiment you did with uh, back in Livermore uh, with the Jonathan. Uh, 